Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats for CWNE 105, Mr. Tom Carpenter. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Um, by the way, if CWNE 105 is in the room, I apologize to you because I'm 104, but that's okay. That's perfectly okay, all right. <laughs> Uh, everybody, thank you very much again for being here. Uh, real quick, as we get started, I may not have the opportunity to get in front of you again, so um, hey, let's just say a big hand clap thanks to the facility, to all the hard work they've done. Let's, let's give it to them because they've worked hard. I, I don't know about you, but I'm very appreciative of all, all of them, uh, right from the lunch service and taking my clean plate away before I spill it on my shirt all the way through to the great job the sound engineers have done and the video production people. Everybody's doing a great job and I really appreciate that. Uh, we're here in this session to talk about Wi-Fi channel access models. Now, you, some of you probably came in and thought you were in the wrong room at first because of the graphic that's in front of you. But uh, it serves a purpose, which will become very clear as we go along. Most of you have heard of the Wi-Fi channel access models that we have available to us. You've heard of the distributed coordination function, the enhanced distributed channel access methods, and so you have heard of it before. But one thing that I've found is that people fall into two camps. They fall into the camp of the people that have heard all about it, and they can even answer exam questions on it, but they really haven't had the light bulb moment. They really don't fully comprehend what's going on here. And then the other camp is the people that understand what's going on, but they lack the ability to explain it to someone else so they can understand what's going on. And so my goal in this presentation is to cover the material, to uh, remind you of what's in DCF and EDCA, but also to help you comprehend it possibly in a way that will assist you in helping other people understand it and that will help you to better comprehend it so that you can better understand how it's impacting your networks because obviously this is a very important component of our network. I don't have the time today to cover every single detail of these access methods uh, that we could cover. We could get into an awful lot of stuff and we could spend four or five hours just talking about DCF and EDCA or EDCAF uh, as a function itself. So, Instead of that, we're gonna focus on the, the bigger picture with a little bit of nitty gritty and go from there. So first of all, it's important for us to remember that in 802.11, we're dealing with a medium that is open. And because it's an open shared medium, we have to deal with some special issues that you don't have to deal with on a wired network or something like that. Uh, so there are multiple devices that are in the same channel and they have to share access in this channel. We cannot simply have some kind of a full duplex connection like we can in wired networks today. Second of all, devices can't detect what's happening at other locations. There's no way they can really know what's going on somewhere else. All they can know is what's happening where they are. And then in addition, because of this, there's some kind of a, an algorithm or method that's needed to assist in the prevention of collisions. And we call that collision avoidance, the algorithm. So, in addition to that, another primary criteria is that devices should be able to detect signals at the lowest modulation rate used in the channel. So you put these pieces together and from them you can formulate a channel access model that will allow devices at least much of the time to be able to communicate such that they do not interfere with each other. And this is really the goal of DCF and EDCA. Now, for example, to help you understand this, we have a distributed coordination function. A distributed coordination function. And we have the enhanced distributed channel access, but remember that the 802.11 standard says the exact phrase that EDCA is a variant of DCF. And so it's still a coordinated function. Now what I mean by that is when we're all in here talking on breaks and everybody has something to say to everybody else, that is not a distributed coordinated function. That is a distributed uncoordinated function. And that's why it gets loud and then it gets louder and then it gets louder and then it gets louder and before you know it, someone gets up and says, it's time to take our seats and nobody hears it. And they say it again 60 seconds later, okay, it's time to take your seats. And everybody's still talking because it's a distributed uncoordinated function. That is that we have not all necessarily agreed upon the rules for how communications are going to happen. 
And I'm, I'm not, by the way, chewing you out for not hearing those messages, just to be clear. Uh, but th that happens because there is no real coordination among us. But with 802.11, there's an agreed upon coordination based on the fact that all of the devices that claim to be 802.11 are going to implement these algorithms within themselves. We also have a strong desire in our life to implement such algorithms in our children. Some of us are still trying. We'll get into that more in a second. So obviously we have CSMA CD if it was needed on the wire. Uh, most of us today, we don't really have to worry about CSMA CD. We've got full duplex connections with the switches and we're not really focused on this so much anymore. But uh, those of you that are like me, you probably remember the old uh, coaxial cable, the BNCT connectors, the terminators on the end, right? How many of you remember those? Excellent, a lot of people in the room. Um, so what we all did, remember, is we would uh, configure that and, and set up a coaxial cable running out our upstairs window and then draping across the open space between our house and the neighbor's house and then we ran it into their window and they connected it to their computer and our computers were connected together and we could all play Warcraft, right? I'm the only one? Oh, I'm sorry, I thought everybody did that. Well, no, we, we did use that kind of system that depended on CSMA CD, but we don't really use those as much these days, at least not at the access layer, and so we're not as concerned about that. So with wireless, though, we have this need for something we've had all the way back to 1997, and we still have the need today, even though we're not dealing with the original 802.11 Prime anymore. And that is that we have to try to avoid collisions because we can't detect them, we can't know that they've happened, although the standard does specify there's a scenario, a couple of scenarios in which we do know that they've happened, and I'll talk a little bit about that later on, uh, or at least we know that something prevented our frame from getting through. So collision avoidance then is about trying to avoid a collision. So let me give you the high level overview, here it is. We start by saying, is anyone talking? Then, if the answer to that is no, we say, well, maybe I should wait a little while before I talk because I'm a courteous communicator. And then if it's still quiet, I think I'll talk, and so I talk. And then I ask, did they hear me? For a very short amount of time. And then if not, I'll say it again. Now, think about this high-level model of communications. Isn't this what all of us want our children to learn? Think about it. It's just normal, courteous human communications, isn't it? We want our children to learn that when an adult is talking or even another child is talking, they don't just interrupt them and start talking, but they sit there quietly, they wait until the other person is done talking. When that other person is done talking, they wait a little while before they talk because they don't want to assume they're jumping in too early before the other person has really finished talking. So we want to make sure that we don't cause interruptions. Now, of course, the way children really behave is they just, you know, walk up to you and say, daddy, 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 hoping to eventually get your input or your attention. And of course, that's how some wireless devices behave as well, particularly non-Wi-Fi devices like HDMI video transmitters. They're just there screaming, daddy, daddy, or mommy. I guess it depends on what the video is going across it, but they're screaming this all the time using 96 to 98 percent utilization in the channel. So the point is that Wi-Fi tries to avoid that. It says, I'm not going to be that bad communicator in the channel, but instead I'm going to try to communicate with courteousness. And when you really think about this, it's a lot like what we all to some extent agree upon as adult humans is courteous communication. Listen before you talk. Make sure no one else is talking before you start talking, right? This is common adult courteous communications. Now I know some adults that I know haven't learned that still, but it is common adult courteous communications. And so this is what is really implemented here in the standard. So when we look at the distributed coordination function or DCF, uh, we can think of it within the station because guess where it happens? Within the station. So it's in each station that this coordinated but distributed function is taking place. And so there are several different components that come together to make this work. We have the concept of something called an interframe space. We have random back off timers. We have carrier sense that is utilized. And all of these things come together to form this thing that we call DCF, the distributed coordination function. The interframe space varies. There are different interframe spaces that are used in order to allow very important frames to be able to have a great likelihood of accessing the medium before less important frames. For example, when you want to send an acknowledgement frame, you probably want to do that pretty quickly, don't you? 
because if you don't, what happens? Well, the device says daddy again. And so to prevent the device from continuing to try to communicate, we're going to step back and say, okay, hold on a second. Let's wait a short inner frame space, then send an acknowledgement. That way the acknowledgement gets through. Um, with DCF, we use a DCF interframe space or diffs before data frames and, and, and many other frames. And so it's longer than a short interframe space. Now you might wonder, well, okay, how long are these things? Well, the short interframe space and the DIFS are defined per phi in the 802 element standard. So these are defined per phi. Uh, SIFS is defined per phi, continuing on even into EDCA. But with EDCA, instead of using the diffs interframe space, we use AIFS, the arbitration interframe space, which is actually defined for each access category. And we'll get into what those are in just a moment. So the interframe space is just listen before you talk. When they stop talking, wait a moment to make sure they're really done talking, and then we'll go ahead and try to talk if everything else is true. So that's the interframe space. The back off timer says, well, I need to make sure that I wait some random amount of time before I talk to try to avoid collisions with other people. Now, we as humans, we have the luxury of multiple forms of communication. So we don't have just audio communication and listening. We also have visual communication. So we have the benefit of looking around before we talk to see if somebody else that we might think is more important than us is about to communicate. And we can allow them to go ahead and talk and defer to them based on another medium through which information is coming to us. In 802.11, we don't have that other medium. It's not like an RF device is also going to have some type of a visual monitoring function or some other kind of function that it can use. So instead of that, we all randomize, and we just try to randomize an extra back off to make sure that we're not stepping on each other, or at least to reduce the likelihood that we are. If I get through the interframe space and the back off timer, okay, then once I get that back off timer to zero, I'm ready to talk. I can transmit my frame. And you might say, okay, but where does carrier sense fit into this? Well, it fits into it all the way through. So as I'm sitting there listening, I'm listening with carrier sense. I've got the opportunity to listen to detect 802.11 frames and know that those are communicating. I can detect other energy on the medium and know that there's something that's at least radiating energy. And uh, I also have a virtual carrier sense that I can utilize. And we'll talk more about those now. So when we get to the uh, 802.11 standard and you take a look at what it gives you, it provides several diagrams to help you understand this concept of the DCF. Uh, we have the interframe spaces, of course, the back off timers, the carrier sense, these things that we've talked about. So how does this carrier sense work? Well, the carrier sense is going to work based on the fact that the client radio, the station radio, I should say, is going to detect signal strength for 802.11 frames. Now, we're not going to get into the nitty-gritty details of specific levels of signal strength that they look at, but let's just say there's a point at which a device will ignore an 802.11 frame and say, I really don't have to acknowledge that that exists because the energy is low enough. And then with energy detect, uh, it will look for a little stronger signal before it would uh, would consider it interference and consider it something that would not allow it to communicate. So both of these are used in order to see if something's going on. This is how it defines out what's going on on the network. And then we also have virtual carrier sense, which is used to set our network allocation vector timer. Now, what is the virtual carrier sense or NAV sent from? What is that set from? What value? That's right, it's the duration value, and it's zero microseconds. What frame always has a zero microsecond value for the duration field? Yes, the one that's in front of us, the acknowledgement frame, why? Well, because there's nothing to come after it in the transaction. This is an important thing to grasp because there's a lot of miscommunication out there about the network allocation vector and the duration value of frames. And a lot of that communication, you'll just see this general statement, it says something like, the duration value contains the duration of the current frame. They say it a lot. You see it in a whole lot of materials. You'll find it in vendor literature. You'll find it in blog posts. You'll find it in books. It's all over the place. But the ACK frame makes it pretty clear to us that that's not true, doesn't it? Because if the duration value is the duration of the current frame, then the ACK frame must take absolutely no time whatsoever on the medium. And that is an amazing frame. I mean, it's like Devin giving a talk. <laughs> it's so fast that it didn't even happen. <laughs> Sorry, Devin. I just had to throw one in there for you. Uh, so the point is that this duration value 
is not the duration of the current frame at all, is it? It's the duration of the remaining things that have to happen to complete the transaction. The remaining things that have to happen could just be one short interframe space in an acknowledgement, or it could be other things as well. But it's telling me what else has to happen to complete this transaction that's currently going on right now between these two stations. That's the duration value. I know if I'm a station and I see that duration value is set to some thousand plus microseconds, if I want to, I can take a nap. And then I can wake up later if I want to. Why? Well, because I know I can't really do anything anyway during that period of time. So the point is the station can use that knowledge, that information to make various kinds of decisions, but certainly to know it's not going to be able to communicate until that time is up. Now then we have our interframe spaces that I talked about. So we have the short interframe space, we have the DCF interframe space, and the arbitration interframe space that I'm talking about here today. Um, the short interframe space is not necessarily the shortest interframe space that's specified in the standard. There's another that's shorter than it, but it was uh, deprecated with the release of 802.11ac. The DCF interframe space is used for all non-QoS data, and the arbitration interframe space is used for QoS stations when they're communicating. So these are different, and we'll talk a little bit more about them as we go on. The back-off timer is the method that we use to randomize when a station is going to be able to communicate. So we do this using a contention window. We call it the contention window because it's during this time that all of the stations are arguing about who gets to talk. No? Oh, okay. I guess I must have misunderstood that. Well, the contention window is called the contention window, and it is actually simply the range of values from which we can pull in order to get our back off number. Now that back off number is not microseconds or seconds or milliseconds or nanoseconds. It's nothing like that. It is simply a number that we multiply by the slot time of the physical layer. And that tells us what our actual back off time is. So if the physical layer slot time is nine microseconds, I get a uh, random value of 10, then it's 90 microseconds, right? That's how long I'm going to back off. So these numbers are chosen, and early on they were specific to the phi, and that was uh, when we had, for example, 802.11b from 0 to 31 is where we would start, and if we had to retransmit, we would double plus one, and if we had to retransmit again, we'd double plus one again, ever increasing this range, so that a uh, device that's failing to communicate will not simply monopolize the medium with retransmissions. Uh, and then with 802.11ag, we shortened this up from 0 to 15 by default, but that 15 number or that 31 number that you see there is what we would call the CW min, the contention window minimum value. The contention window minimum value can be confusing because its name sounds like it's the minimum possible value, but it's actually the minimum upper value that we start with. So it's actually the minimum maximum value that we begin with, and then later on when we get to CW max, we're now at the maximum maximum value. So you have a minimum maximum value and you have a maximum 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 value, you can get quite confusing if you're not careful. We'll get to that in a minute, a minute some more. So uh, here we have the DCF overview again. These are the things that are involved in DCF. So we have, first of all, at the top, our inner frame space and our random back off. And so these are fixed with every frame transmission that we're going to do, we're going to utilize these. With carrier sense, we're always gonna listen before we talk, and then the duration or ID value may be applicable, it might set our nav, and we know that we have to count that down before we can actually do anything else on the medium. Remember the duration is what comes after the current frame. It is not the duration of the current frame in order to complete a transaction. Therefore, if it's the last frame in a transaction, the duration value is always set to zero. Now this brings us then to what modern devices use today. Pretty much everything from 802.11n forward is able to use EDCA. And of course, some older devices could potentially if they enhance the chipsets after 2005 when 802.11e was ratified. So what we have in the standard then is really four different coordination functions that could be utilized for our standard wireless networks. We have DCF, PCF, EDCA, and HCCA, and you're tested on all of these on the CWNA exam. No, I'm kidding, of course. We're only gonna test you all people actually use. No one likes to use point coordination function. No one's using HCCA in any significant way. And so therefore, what we're looking at is DCF and what they call here HCF contention access or EDCA. So these are the two primary methods that are being utilized and notice the thing they have in common is they're both based on 
contention processes, or they're both coordinated functions that are distributed where devices use contention opportunities to gain access to the medium. Now, when we talk about this, we need to understand the different components of EDCAF. Now, let me first of all clarify the difference between EDCA and EDCAF. EDCA is the general name of this new algorithm, if you will, that enhances DCF. There is no such thing as EDCF. You'll hear that mentioned and even see it in some books and things like that. There's no such thing. There's EDCA and there's EDCAF. EDCAF is a specific implementation of EDCA for one of your prioritization queues. So each prioritization queue has its own EDCA function. That's called an EDCAF. And there are four of those queues, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. So first of all, we have a MAC frame that we need to process through the EDCAF component. Now remember, this is all happening in a station. There's nobody telling me what to do. I'm abiding by the rules. I'm doing this in my station, right? So the first thing with EDCAF then is we have access categories. Access categories are the categories of access priority that we place the frames into. So the frames are placed into or tagged or marked with an access category. And then that places them in the proper queue for that access category. Once in the queue, we have to generate our random back off timer. We have to use the arbitration interframe space number in order to determine what our arbitration interframe space actually is. And then with that information, we can wait for a TX op, counting down to it when it comes and we're ready for it because we've counted down our back off timer, we've counted down our interframe space, then we can perform a transmission. So EDCAF is a bit more complex than DCF, but remember, it still sits on top of that same basic foundation. So everything is still there under the hood. These access categories we're talking about then are fourfold within the standard as implemented in devices today. So the standard actually specifies six different uh, access categories that could be utilized. You have ACBK, ACBE, ACVI, and ACVO, but you also have an alternate video and an alternate voice. This was introduced, I alluded to it yesterday, in 802.11 AA 2012, and it's part of the 802.11 2016 standard. 802.11 AA 2012 was an amendment that was ratified in order to enhance robust audio and video streaming. And so that's where they gave us two extra cues. So those cues could be prioritized differently. That is, we could say that the ACVI queue is the highest priority video queue, and the ACVI alternate queue is the next highest priority uh, voice queue, but higher still than the ACVI queue. So we can have what's called intra access category prioritization. IACP is the acronym since we always want to have one more acronym. So this is uh, again introduced in 802.11 uh, AA 2012 if you didn't know that that happened. So what we're going to do is we're going to take our 802.1D or if you prefer 802.1P user priority tags 0 through 7. We're going to map them to these access categories. The access categories then are background best effort video and voice and the priority here is uh, lowest to highest. So background lowest voice is the highest in this order that we have right here. Uh, that doesn't have to be the case. You could totally mess up your network by playing around with your uh, values for uh, WMM and make it so that voice is the lowest priority and background is the highest priority. So don't mess with your WMM settings if you don't know what you're doing because you can totally mess up your QoS by going through that process. The good news is, of course, you would have only messed it up in the uh, transmission uh, of whatever that device is and not necessarily hurt every device on your network unless, of course, you're configuring them centrally in a controller and you make that mistake. So you want to avoid that. So then we have our transmission queues and what the transmission cues are is the place where we put the frame while it's waiting for a transmit opportunity to be able to be transmitted onto the RF medium. And so again, the standard as it's implemented today in devices has the four cues of voice, video, best effort, and background. And there's an EDCA function, as I said, for each and every one of these cues. Now, to bring some of these pieces together, and this is kind of hard to see on this screen, if you can see that, 
you are astounding or you have some really good glasses. But uh, this is basically a partial frame capture uh, showing us the WMM or WME, depending on how the decode shows it, of the actual QoS parameters from an access points beacon frame. And so when we look at these parameters, it's going to show us how that it is configuring, for example, this one value I talked about called the AIFSN. The AIFSN, now this is really complicated, okay? So AIFS is the arbitration interframe space. Then we're gonna add another letter to it, and this is where it gets really complicated because that N stands for something really complicated, the word number. So it's the AIFS number, that's all it is. So very easy to remember that actually. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna take that AIFSN, whatever specified for the BSS, and we're going to multiply that in an algorithm by the slot times to figure out exactly how long the AIFS is going to be. So remember, the, the different phi's have different slot times, so we're gonna multiply that by the slot time to figure out actually how long the AIFS is. And interestingly enough then, an AIFS can actually be longer than a DCF IFS. So a, a lot of people will simply say, well, DCFs are uh, longer than AIFS because AIFS is used for QoS, so it's kind of an assumption that's made. It's an AIFS interframe space, right? And it's used for QoS, so surely it's shorter. Well, is that really true? Would, would I want all of my frames that are communicated by a QoS station to be transmitted with a shorter interframe space? No, not necessarily, right? And so actually an AIFS can be longer than a diffs. Uh, it depends on what this AIFS N is set to. That's going to determine it. And so when we take a look then at these values, they tell us what that interframe space is. Therefore, we have a variable length interframe space. It's not a fixed length, it's a variable length interframe space, depending on these parameters. Each, of course, of the queues is fixed once they're set, but we can't simply say there's one AIFS. And that's why the standard refers to an AIFS per access category, because it is fixed for the category based on the parameters. And then we also see in here the contention window min and the contention window max, which is a way that this is prioritized as well. So if you could see this, you would be able to see that for voice, the CW min is three and the CW max is seven. And so therefore, when I'm trying to figure out what my random back off timer is, I'm going to draw a number from zero to three at first. If I have to retry, I'm gonna draw a number for every retry thereafter for voice from zero to seven. I'm never going to go any higher because my CW max is seven. Hopefully the client drivers are going to at some point decide they need to do something different than just keep retrying, but there will not be an increase in the total range of the contention window once I've reached CW max. And CW max for voice is only seven, which means there's only one increase in the window range, because remember we always double plus one. So if we start with zero to three, and three was CW min, and I double it and add one, what do I get? I get seven, and I'm done. I have no more doubling up that I can do, okay? So WMM then defines these uh, parameters that can be used and certified that a device implements WMM. Of course it implements this based on 802.11e 2005, and the access categories therein and so forth. All right, so I thought, those of you who know me, you know that I am just one of the world's most amazing graphics designers. So I wanted to have a really good graphic here for you to address the parameters. So what I did, and this was amazingly creative, is I opened up my text notes on these parameters and took a screenshot and put it in my slide. So that's what we're looking at here. These are the various perimeter notes. So you don't have to dig through the five for these uh, or through the 802.11 standard, I should say. And by the way, this is a good point for me to note something. I have not disagreed with hardly anything anyone said here at the conference, but I have disagreed with someone. Glenn, I'm sorry, but you're wrong. The 802.11 standard is such exciting reading material that I read it <laughs> when I'm trying to stay awake. I read it when I'm trying to stay awake. <laughs> 
Uh, but actually, uh, you know, I, I, I actually don't have that problem. It doesn't put me to sleep. I love it. I, I run into these situations where someone says something on Twitter and I say, huh. And before you know it, I've been in the standard for about two and a half, three hours. Um, uh, it just, it, to me, it's exciting information every time I go back in there. But what I've done is I've harvested this information for you. Of course, we're providing the slides from all the presentations to you, so those will be available to you afterwards. But this is basically just a quick rundown of some of the information that's in the file. Now, first of all, you can't see it very well in the projection. It's kind of cutting off the top there. But that says Rx Phi start. And that's a parameter a lot of people don't think much about when they're studying it to 11. It can range from 20 to 192 microseconds. But basically, um, this is the, uh, a part of the algorithm that we use to determine how long we wait to get back an acknowledgment. So I've had people ask me this a lot. You know, OK, you say that you send a frame. And if you don't get back an acknowledgment, you assume it was lost, it was corrupted, whatever. Uh, how do I know how long that is? Well, there's an answer. It's in the standard. You can uh, say that you're going to wait a SIFS plus a slot plus the RX Phi start delay, whatever that is. And so if you take that algorithm, then you know that if the Phi does have an RX Phi start delay of 20 microseconds, and then you've got the SIFs, and then you've got the slot time, then you can calculate how long that client's going to wait before it says, hey, I, you didn't hear from me. And what you find out is that it's even worse than your kids. You know, the kids are like, daddy, 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 or mommy, 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 mommy. But no, not this device. It's like I sent my frame. Hey, why didn't I hear from you? It's literally that quick, because these devices think in microseconds. They're not like us. So if they don't receive it back in that amount of time, whatever that algorithm specifies, then it's considered to be failed. When it comes to the various slot times, how long are they for that formula above and other formulas? Well, with DSSS and HRDSSS, it's 20 microseconds. And by the way, if you didn't know this, it is a requirement to become a CWE that you have to be able to say DSSS right every time getting the right number of S's in there very, very quickly. That's one of the things we look for uh, when we're looking at applicants. You love my jokes, don't you? <laughs> uh, OFDM, the Orthogonal Frequency Division Multiplexing Phi, nine microseconds. Quick tip for you if you're not going to take the class or you're not going to read the book, but you want to sit CWNA 107, um, you know, you, when you're studying for these exams, you need to remember the differences between a phi name and a modulation method because there are a lot of phis that use OFDM for modulation, but there's only one phi named OFDM. They are different things. Uh, nine microseconds for that one. ERP is 9 or 20 because we're down there in 2.4 gigahertz, right? We have to play nice. Uh, HT is 9 or 20 if it's in uh, 2.4 gigahertz. It could be because we have to play nice. And VHT is 9 microseconds. So these are the slot times for these different phi's. SIFs times uh, for DSSS and HRDSSS is 10 microseconds. OFDM 16, ERP 10, HT 10 or 16, depending on if it's 2.4 or 5 gigahertz and VHT 10 microseconds. Now why do we care about all that? We care about all that because that's how we understand how long a DCF interframe space is. A DCF, uh, DCF interface space is a SIFS plus two times the slot. Now this is the formula from the standard. A D DIFFS is SIFS plus two times the slot. Now we didn't want to confuse you, so the AIFS is the AIFS N times the slot plus the SIFS. We couldn't put the SIFS first both times. That would just be too confusing. That was another one of my good jokes, in case you didn't get it. <laughs> Uh, so so the, the reality is the formulas are kind of the same in reverse. But this is the order in which they're presented in the standard. Uh, maybe they're just testing whether you know operator precedence when you do math or not. But basically, we're going to take the SIFs, which we learn up here how long that is, plus 2 times the slot, which we learn up here how long that is. So if we're taking HT in 2.4 gigahertz, we know that the SIFs time for HT is 10 microseconds in 2.4 gigahertz. Then we need to know what is the slot time for HT in 2.4 gigahertz. Well, let's assume we had to use the 20 microsecond slot time. It's 2 times 20. That gives us 40. Therefore, we know that the diffs for HT in 2.4 gigahertz, when we have to use the 20 microsecond slot time, is equal to the results of that calculation, which I lost track of. What was it? I'm sorry? 
50, thank you very much, okay. So then AIFSN gets a little bit different because remember we have that number. And now we get to play around with what an interframe space duration is. Before with DCF we didn't get to play with it. We used what we got, we didn't have anything else. Now we get to adjust it to prioritize things for QoS in our environment. Now if you're in small to medium business, I wouldn't encourage you to play around with your WMM parameters because in most cases you don't have enough traffic for it to have a massive impact and difference on that network. There's just not enough there. But in very high density in scenarios like that, certainly you could probably have some impact and even in some corporate deployments. So I'm not saying you'll never run into it in small to medium business, but generally speaking, you know, that ASUS wireless LAN router you're using is going to be fine. That was another joke. Come on, guys. Come on. Okay, so now that we've seen my great graphics capabilities, let me wrap up by giving you a couple of examples to help kind of bring this home. So you know that we have this thing called RTS-CTS, uh, or if you don't know, we have this thing called RTS-CTS. And RTS-CTS allows you to kind of clear the air for communications. But if we pause and think about the things that we've talked about, there are some things that we've learned or that we've explored together that can help us understand how RTS-CTS actually get the job done. So when you look at an RTS frame, it looks like a kind of nice little cute guy that's going to go out on your network and do some work for you. It's not a huge frame. If you look at the general frame format in the 802.11 standard, which I'm sure that Peter has memorized and would like for all of you to memorize, um, then if you take a look at that, you will see that there's a lot more stuff in there. We don't have all that in here. And then the CTS gets even cuter and littler. We get rid of the transmitter address even, so it's just not important for that frame. Very tiny frames, but these very tiny frames pack a big punch. In fact, they have some of the largest duration sizes that we see on our network in the duration field of the frame control field, the duration subfield of the frame control field. And that's because they're talking about a lot of other things that have to happen after them. So with the RTS, for example, after the RTS comes a SIF, then a CTF, then a SIF, then the data, then a SIF, then the ACT. And so it, it's got to count all of that up, add it up as a total, put it in its duration value. And then if you look at a packet capture, and you can actually see the RTS, the CTS, the data frame, and the ACT, or block ACT if you're doing a block ACT transaction or something like that, whatever it is you're looking at, if you look at that, you'll get to see the duration value counting down. And so you see it's getting lower, and it's getting lower as it goes down the chain. So when we look at RTS on the uh, left-hand or right-hand side here, rather, you can see the flow of traffic that happens in an RTS-CTS communication. Of course, if we're doing a, a, a CTS-only communication or CTS to self, which is an interesting name, isn't it really? I mean, if you think about that, have you ever thought about that? Have there ever been times in your life when you just needed to pause and say to yourself, you know, I think I'm about to say something. I wish I'd be quiet. <laughs> have you ever really thought about it? And, and, and yet we call this a CTS itself. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to just send that to myself and tell myself to be quiet. That's what I'm going to do. Um, but but it's, it's, a, it's a CTS without an RTS. That's all a CTS to self is that it's sometimes called, right? Um, so basically, we're just going to send out a CTS frame and set everybody to be quiet. But how is that possible? Someone shout it out. How does the RTS CTS tell everybody to be quiet and work when I'm about to send a high data rate frame? What's the secret? Low data rate, exactly. So RTS, CTS are going out at a low data rate, so everybody can demodulate it. And since they can all demodulate it, they can see the duration ID field. Can every device in a BSS see the duration field in every frame? No, it cannot, can it? So, you know, in, in simple discussion sometimes of DCF or EDCA, you'll hear somebody say, you know, so this way all the stations can see that duration value and they know how long the transaction is going to take after the frame. No, they can't, except in the RTS, CTS, or other frames, or if that data frame happens to be going at the lowest rate in the band or the phi. So the reality is that not every station can demodulate these high data rate frames. And in fact, you could probably guesstimate that somewhere between 30 to 50% of those in the cell will not be able to. And so they're not using it. But it really doesn't hurt them. That's all right. They, they could see the phi header. And there's some length information and data rate information in there. So if they're smart enough to use it, they can take advantage of that. If they're not smart enough to use it, we'll just call them kids and say it's their own fault. They shouldn't have jumped off that roof. I don't know where that came from either. It's okay. My mind does interesting things sometimes. Okay, so basically then what we're looking at when we see this 
uh, access to the medium happening. The reason RTS-CTS can work is because of this coordinated function that's out there in all the stations. If all the stations didn't agree on this, if this was like some uh, poor behaving child or even a poor behaving adult that doesn't accommodate normal human communication courtesies, then all, everything goes out the window, doesn't it? Okay. So this works when everybody agrees on how we're going to coordinate. And that's why RTS-CTS can actually function. Without that agreement in all the stations, it wouldn't do any good to send out an RTS because the station would say, well, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and send my data frame with the SIFs because I've got a trick up my sleeve. And that is that I know the next frame needs to wait a SIFs. And I don't want to wait a disk because if I have to wait a diffs or an AIFS, I'm going to have to wait longer than a SIFs. And I'm not going to get to talk. And this guy keeps hogging up all the medium with his RTS-CTSs. So I'm just going to go ahead and talk anyway. The point is a device could do that if a programmer decided to be mean. But as long as they all agree and work based on this 802.11 standard, then RTS-CTS can work. Why? Well, the key is in these short interframe spaces between the RTS and the CTS and the CTS and the data and the data and the ACK. And one thing that we see here as well is that not every data frame with DCF is preceded by a diffs. Some are preceded by a SIFS, aren't they? Because we've already gotten approval to consume the medium. So I don't have to wait uh, diffs in that case or an arbitration interframe space in that case. Moral of the story is simply this. Your devices communicate really no differently than human beings that are courteous to one another. And as long as you remember that if human beings communicate courteously, then they can all get along and everyone can get their chance to talk, then you'll realize that in 802.11, as long as these devices communicate courteously, they'll all get along and they'll all be able to talk. But of course, there's always that one person, isn't there? That's what we call non-Wi-Fi interference. Non-Wi-Fi interference is that one person that always wants to come in and not abide by the rules. And, and then what do you do? Simple. You leave the room. You walk away from them. You go to a different place to have your conversation. And that's one of the things we do with Wi-Fi, too, when non-Wi-Fi doesn't want to abide by the rules, isn't it? We move to a different channel. We say, I'm going to get out of here. Or the other option you have is throw them out. I prefer that option. Throw them out. I want to hear it. Throw them out. Throw them out. Come on. Throw them out. Throw them out. All right. Who am I talking about? I forget. What, what, what are we, who are we throwing out here? Oh, non-Wi-Fi interferes, aren't we? Well, you know, sometimes you can't. And when you can't, you change rooms. When you can, you throw them out. And those are the two primary solutions we have to non-Wi-Fi interferers if they're significantly interfering. And they're the two primary solutions you have to humans that don't abide by common courtesy in human communications. So the next time someone asks you, how do all those wireless devices work anyway? Simply say, you know how we listen before we talk? That's how it all works. Thank you.